Hey, what's up everyone? So I have something new for you today because we are not going to write code, but instead we are going to read code. And more specifically, we are going to read code from the Swift standard library. So how is it possible that we can actually read the source code from the Swift standard library? Well, Swift is an open source language, meaning that its source code is available on GitHub. And the standard library has one more specificity is that it is implemented in Swift, meaning that, well, the code is readable for Swift developers. Now, as you can imagine, there are a lot of files in the Swift standard library. So I had to choose what I wanted to show you. And so we are going to focus only on three implementations. We are going to take a look at how map, compact map and comparable are implemented. And my goal with this is going to be well to show you what is under the hood of these very common functions and protocol that we use almost every day when we develop in Swift. So let's start by taking a look at how map is implemented. So as you can see, I am in a file called sequence.swift. So map is implemented at the level of the protocol sequence. And well, let me do a command F to search for map. So as you can see, here is the place where map is implemented. So here we see the signature of map. So we are already familiar with it as Swift developers. So you call map on a sequence. You pass in a closure that transforms every element of the sequence into a new generic type T. And well, map is going to return an array of T. So basically, it maps an array of elements or a sequence of elements to an array of T. And so the question is, well, how is this function implemented in the standard library? And the reason why I wanted to focus on this function is that, well, if I ask you to implement map, I think we would all have the same strategy. You know, we declare a new array of type T, we iterate over each element in the sequence, we transform the element using the transform closure, and we append the result to the array. So this is, we could say, the naive implementation of map. But as we are going to see, well, the version implemented in the standard array is actually better optimized than this. So let me scroll down a little in order well to see all the code for the implementation. So now we see everything and we see that the function map actually begins by getting what is called the underestimated count of the sequence. So underestimated count is a property that's available on every sequence and it basically returns a number that is going to be less than or equal the actual count of the sequence. And the idea behind this property is that there are sequences for which the count is easy to compute. For instance, an array, well, it's just a number of elements in the array, but there are other sequences where the actual count is harder to compute. And an example of this is string. Since a string uses Unicode, well, to know the number of characters in a string, you actually need to go over every element of the strings because, well, two, we could say, elements in the string can actually combine into a single character. Think, for instance, an E with an acute accent. And so here, using underestimated count, we get an initial capacity for the result array. Then, as you can see, we are instantiating, or actually the standard library is instantiating a contiguous array of T and is reserving the initial capacity in the array. And this is a very important optimization because when we append to an array, well, we make the array grow. And so when the array grows, well, it needs to allocate for more memory space. And this is a costly operation. However, when we reserve straight from the start the capacity that we know we will actually need, then we won't need to allocate for more memory when we append. And so this is an important optimization. OK, so what's happening after this? So we get the iterator for the sequence. And then, as you can see, we iterate from zero up to the initial capacity. And what we do inside this loop is that, so using the iterator, we get the next element. It's OK to force unwrap this element because we know that it does exist because we are only iterating up to the underestimated count of the sequence. So we know that in the sequence, there is at least the initial capacity amount of elements. Then using the transform, we transform the element. And finally, we append it to the result array. And remember that since we have reserved a capacity in the array, appending to the array is not going to trigger new memory allocation. And then finally, so if there are still elements in the sequence, so meaning there are still elements that were not, we could say, accounted for by the underestimated count, well, we get also those elements, this time by iterating directly over the iterator, and we still do the same thing. So we transform the element and we append. 
So this time appending does mean, well, growing the array as we go. But the idea is that most of the elements will have already been looked at in this loop. And so this second loop that is less optimized is going to be either zero or, well, as few elements as possible. And finally, the final line. So we take the contiguous array and we turn it into a regular array. And so this is how map is implemented in Swift. So as we've seen, there is actually some optimization under the hood. It's not a very complex optimization, meaning that, well, when we read the code, we understand what is happening. So there is not, we could say, some low level magic, but it does show that using map actually is more optimized than doing a for loop and manually transforming all the elements of the sequence. So if you are ever in a situation where you don't know if you should do a for loop over a sequence or a map, well, now that we have seen how map is implemented, we know that actually in most situation using map is going to be more optimized than manually iterating over all the elements of the sequence. And before we move on to the second function I want to show you, we can take a look here on the line 631. We can see that as part of the documentation of the function, there is some information about the complexity of the function, meaning how long it will take to execute. And we can see that this function is big O of n, where n is the length of the sequence. And so the complexity of the function is proportional to the length of the sequence. And as we've seen, this optimization is possible thanks to this optimization right here, where we are reserving an initial capacity on the array. Now it's time to move on to the second function I want to show you, and we're going to take a look at compact map. So compact map is actually not implemented in sequence.swift. To find it, we need to go and look at the file sequencealgorithms.swift. So once again, let me do a search for compact map. And so as you can see, this is where compact map is implemented. So just like before, let me begin by focusing on what is the signature of compact map. So compact map is actually quite similar to map, but there is one important difference. And is that, as you can see, the closure, so the transform closure is going to return an optional. But compact map itself is still going to return an array of non-optional value. And so, as you can imagine, when you compare it with map, well, compact map has one extra step, and it's that compact map is going to get rid of all the elements for which the transform closure has yielded a nil value. And as you can see, when we take a look at the complexity, well, the complexity for compact map is actually higher than the one for map. In map, it was just big O of n, where n was the length of the sequence. And this time is big O of m plus n, where n is still the length of the sequence and m is the length of the result. So as we can already see when we take a look at this line from the documentation, well, compact map is a little less optimized than map. And to understand why, well, let's take a look at how it is implemented. So. As you can see, under the hood, there is actually just a call to a private function. So I'm going to keep scrolling to see what this private function looks like. Here we are. And as you can see, well, this time, and a little bit surprisingly, well, the implementation of compact map is very similar, actually, to what we would have written if we had to implement it. So the function begins by declaring a result array. So it's an array of element of result and the initial value is the empty array. And then, well, the function is simply iterating over the sequence and for each element, well, it calls the closure transform. And if the result of calling transform on the element was not nil, well, then that result is appended to the array result and that array is finally returned at the end of the function. So this is actually, well, much closer to the, well, we could say naive implementation we could have come up with. And as we can see, this implementation is less optimized than when we were using map. And the reason is that this time, well, the function is not using the underestimated count. And Actually, it does make sense not to use underestimated count because we do not know well how many calls to transform are going to yield nil results and how many are going to actually return actual values. And so it's not possible to reserve an initial capacity for the resulting array because we do not have any clues as to how many elements there will actually be in the resulting array. So that's why compact map is actually a little less optimized. And so as we can see, we are still going to need to go over all of the elements of the sequence, but also every time that we append a new element 
difference in the result, there is a cost in memory. And so what this means is that, well, if we call compact map with a transform closure is going to yield a lot of nil values, then the performance of compact map is going to be very close to performance of map because the length of the result array is going to be very small. But on the other hand, if we call compact map with a closure that is going to yield very few nil values, well, then the performance of compact map is going to be actually worse than the performance of map, and it can be up to two times worse because, well, if there is zero nil values, then m is going to be equal to n. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that compact map is a bad function and that you should always use map. Most of the time, when we use map or compact map on a sequence where there are a few dozens elements, well, it's not going to be a big difference. But, well, if one day you need to actually handle a sequence where there are hundreds or maybe thousands of elements, then this information about the actual complexity of the functions map or compact map might be useful to you. And finally, we are going to move to the last piece of code I want to show you in this video, and it is how comparable is defined and implemented in the standard library. So we are moving to the file comparable.swift. So comparable is a protocol and is a protocol that you want to conform to when you want to be able to compare instances, meaning when you want to use one of these operators. So less than, less than or equal, greater than or equal, or greater than. And something that you might have noticed is that when you conform to comparable, you can use all of these four operators, but you only need to define one, you only need to define less than. And so we're going to see how it is possible that we can actually use four different operators, even though we only have to define one. So let me scroll down a bit beyond the documentation so that we can take a look at the actual definition of the protocol. So as you can see, comparable is defined right here. You can see that it inherits from equitable, so you cannot be comparable if you are not also equitable. And then you can see that just below, so the four operators are being defined as a requirement to conform to the protocol. So we have less than, less than or equal, greater than or equal, and finally greater than. But as I've said, when we conform to comparable, we only need to implement this operator right here. And this is possible thanks to the code that is just below. So as you can see, just below, we have an extension of comparable and there are some default implementations in it. And so as you can see, first we see a default implementation for the operator greater than. And you can see that the reason that we don't need to implement greater than is because, well, it's totally possible to implement greater than by using less than. And the reason why is that when you want to check if the left hand side is greater than the right hand side, well, this is actually equivalent to checking if the right hand side is less than the left hand side. So as we can see, we can implement greater than in terms of using less than. And that is why we don't need to implement by hand greater than. And as you can imagine, it's going to be the same thing for the two others operator. So when you want to implement less than or equal, well, you can just use less than flip the left hand side with the right hand side and take the opposite. And finally, when you want to implement greater than or equal, well, you just need to use less than and once again, take the opposite. And so that is the reason why you only need to implement the less than operator. That's because for the three other operator, well, they can be implemented by flipping some arguments, taking the opposite and actually just using less than. And so we don't need to implement them. There are already some default implementation for them. And actually, most of the time, you do not want to provide your own implementation for these three operators. The default implementation are going to work just fine. And having your own implementation would just, well, run the risk of introducing a bug. I think the only instances where it would make sense to actually have your own implementation is if this implementation could, well, use some significant optimization in order to compute the result faster. But in most situations, when comparing two instances, it's just going to boil down to comparing two properties of the instances. You absolutely do not need to implement your own versions of these three operators. 
And so that's all for this video where I wanted to show you, well, a glimpse of what you can see when you take a look at the source files for the Swift standard library. So in the description of the video, I've put the link to the GitHub and I can only encourage you well, to go check it out, to browse the files a little bit. As you're going to see, some of the files are quite complex, but there are also some parts that are well, as the one we've seen, fairly easy to understand. And I think as a Swift developer, you know, spending one or two hours browsing through the Swift library, taking a look at how it is implemented, I think it can be super interesting because, well, it's going to help you have a better understanding of how Swift works under the hood and, well, to understand better how the tools that you are using on a daily basis actually work. As always, if you have enjoyed the video, you can leave a little like, you can share the video with your colleagues if you think they will be interested in the topic. Thanks a lot for watching the video and see you next time.